Revelation chapter 1. How many of you are glad you're saved tonight? Say amen. amen. All righty. I just appreciate so very, very much the great spirit that you all bring with you to church every time you're here. It encourages my heart tremendously, and it really does. And uh, people come to church with a sour attitude. I hope they're able to get it fixed before they walk out because I don't want it to affect me, that's for sure. And uh, bad attitude's a lot like lice. Once you get around other people, they're all going to have lice, and I don't want to have that happen with me with a bad attitude. <clears throat> and you all are tremendous by having a great attitude, and I want to thank you for that. Revelation chapter 1. Let's read verses 1, 2, and 3 together out loud, please. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, reading with me out loud. Everyone now. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. And Brother Dale, I'll be using this one tonight, so I did not turn it on yet, but it's on now. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for the privilege of being able to be in church. The honor that we have of being in this place tonight is beyond words. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for being able to be in church tonight. I think of the many pastors that are out there tonight. Lord, if they had an evening service, some have canceled their services. And I thank you, Lord, for us being able to be here tonight. Now, Lord, for our church family who are here and for those who are out there somewhere listening in, watching perhaps, I pray, dear God, that you give all of us tonight something that we need. And if you'll do that, I know that our time will not be wasted in church tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The first thing that I want to do is I want to give you an outline of the book and it's a double-sided piece of paper on one side it has a written outline of the book of revelation and on the other side it has a prophetic timetable line uh, of the book of revelation and you'll be able to use that and what i'm going to ask you to do is possibly keep that with you every time you come to church and you can see what's going on on the timeline so brother dale everybody gets one of those tonight and uh we'll keep the rest of them uh, stored away for folks that are not here with us tonight. The book of Revelation. The Apostle John uh, took over the pastoral work in Ephesus around 70 AD or so, and the Roman Emperor Domitian uh, intensified the persecution, which began with Nero. And you know, Nero was the one who ended up putting the Apostle Paul to death at one time, had his head cut off. Domitian promoted a thing called emperor worship. What a terrible thing for any man uh, under any century, at any, under any circumstance to promote that of emperor worship. And everyone had to address him, believe it or not, as Lord and God. Lord and God. Sounds an awful lot like the pharaohs of Egypt who said that the sun rose and set on them. And they were the rising sun, they said. And here Domitian said he was Lord and God. And he was bitter in his treatment of both the Jews and the Christians. And it was his command that John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. He's the one that put him there. And the reason he put him there was because he was preaching Jesus Christ, teaching and preaching the word of God, you see. And it was from this isolated spot that John received visions that make up the entire book of Revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that all happened right around 95 AD. Those facts may or may not be important to you, but that's about the time that it happened and the reason he was there. Now, John, he uh, also got uh, a reputation because of his prayer life. They called him Old Camel Knees because he spent so much time on his knees in prayer that his knees were like that of camels, just covered with calluses and, and hard skin, amazing man. John was a man that they boiled in oil but did not kill him. And so I'm sure he was scarred, something fierce. Amazing man, a man of God. This book has a number of characteristics, and I want to start tonight in this Bible study, this sermon series, if you please. Now, I know it's a Bible study, but I might have to preach a little bit. 
You just never know. Uh, it's like the Bible says that a teacher in the Bible is apt to teach. Brother Penn looked at me one day and he said, that means they're apt to do it. Well, I'm apt to preach a little bit along the way. Don't know that it'll happen tonight. Number one, the book of Revelation is prophetic. The book of Revelation is prophetic. Now, you have your Bible there. We're going to be looking at a number of verses here that show that exact truth. Number one under that would be the Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So we find out in verse 3 it's called prophecy. Secondly, I want you to see that it's also said in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 11. Revelation 10 and 11, it says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, establishing the fact that the revelation of Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation, was a book of prophecy. <clears throat> revelation chapter 22 and verse 7, the Bible says, Behold, I come quickly, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy, of, of the prophecy of this book. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man... And by the way, go down to verse 10, if you would please, and you'll see those words. And it says, uh, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall look at verses 18 and 19, if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of the, uh, the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, I want you to notice something about that. These verses that we just read are often applied to the entire Bible, but that is not fair to Scripture. It's speaking of adding to the words of this prophecy, not adding to any of Now, the Bible does condemn adding to anything that God has said in other places in the Bible. This particular part of Revelation is speaking of the prophecy of Revelation. He said, don't add to it, don't take away from it. And so, and he meant what he said. So the book is prophetic. And from chapter four on, we have a prophecy of actual events that will transpire on this earth and in heaven after believers are raptured off of this earth. And so we have to understand it's a prophetic book. It tells what's going to happen out there in the future. Secondly, I want you to notice this about this book. It is Christ-centered. It is Christ-centered. In your Bible, it says... Uh, that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. We have to understand here, this is showing us about Jesus, but notice this, this is not John's revelation of Jesus Christ, but rather Jesus' revelation of himself because the scripture is given by inspiration of God. You see, we have to understand that. Now, John wrote in chapter 14 in verse 21, it says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. It was John who referred to himself numerous times in the Bible as the disciple whom Jesus loved. So revelation is all about Jesus. It's about Jesus showing himself and showing what's going to be happening. Now notice again the promise in John chapter 14 in verse 21 that he said and promised that he would manifest himself to those who loved and kept his commandments. The word manifest is a marvelous word, and I think it's been misappropriately applied by many preachers that I've listened to. But the word manifest here means that he will reveal himself to those uh, who love his word, those who keep his commandments. I've said to you often, you know folks who know Jesus, don't you? And they know him. They know him as Savior. Perhaps they've been saved for a long time. Maybe they've been saved as long as I have, 56 years. But yet it seems like they don't know him very well. And that's sad. They know about him. They know that he's in the Bible. They know that he's called the Savior. They know that he's called the Son of God. They know a lot of facts about him. But the bottom line is they don't have a good relationship with him. And they don't know him like they ought to. What is the key? 
The key is John 14, 21, where the Bible says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And notice Jesus' own words, and I will love him and will manifest, make known. I will uncover the secrets of the word of God of myself to him. The Bible says, the secret, back in Deuteronomy, it says that the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Oh, it says, no, the secret things belong to the Lord. But in Psalm 25, it says very plainly that God will give his secret things to those who fear him. And so God has things that he keeps to himself. Why? Because he doesn't trust everybody with the secrets. Now, let me make it practical. Everybody in this room knows something that is private and secret to you, don't you? You can shake your head up and down, and it, it, it's your secret, isn't it? It's no one else's. You don't share that secret with just anybody, do you? Of course you don't. If you were to share it with someone, you would only share it with someone whom you trusted with your life. And that's what God is saying. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And he says here, only the people who love his commandments and keep his commandments and love his word like they ought to are the ones to whom he will reveal himself, to whom he will make himself known to them. You hear some people pray and it's, you know, you, you, if you've listened to them pray, and I guess maybe I'm being judgmental now, but it almost seems like when they pray, they're talking to you. I'm gonna ask you to respond now. How many of you have ever been in a service where the person who's led the service or opened in prayer sounded like they were talking to you. Anybody like that? Yeah, we've all been there. And they're supposed to be talking to the Lord. And that's the way it should be. And I know preachers. Uh, in fact, I've done it before in the past. I don't do it anymore. But during their praying, they will be preaching. And Lord, we pray that you'd help that fellow sitting back there in the fifth row up, help him to sit up straight and listen rather than talking to his wife. Well, what's that got to do with my sermon? And Lord, help all these children down here on the front row. Help all of them to sit up straight and not be poking their neighbor and not be passing notes and all the right. Yeah, that's not a prayer. That's preaching. That's discipline. But then, you know, folks, when they get up and talk, it's like you're not in the room because they're not talking to you. And I've told the illustration before, but the story is told of Billy Sunday, one of the great preachers of the uh, 20, early 20th century. As he and his wife, Ma, Sunday, were walking down the sidewalk, she said, looked over at him and said, what did you say, Billy? And Billy said, I wasn't talking to you, Ma. In other words, he was walking and talking and went to the Lord Jesus. And there are those, we know the stories of Robert Sheffy, where the Ministerial Association got a hold of Robert Sheffy. They said the townspeople were complaining because he would go out on the side of a hill and there he would pray out loud. And, they, and he asked him, what's wrong with that? And they said, well, it sounds as though you're actually talking to God. And he looked at them and said, well, sirs, to whom do you talk when you pray? And there are those who know Jesus as Savior, and they know about him historically. They know about him even biblically, but they don't have a close relationship to the Lord Jesus. And that's what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 14. And in John 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's, that is said numerous times throughout the word of God. Jesus will make himself known to those who love him. So first of all, we understand that revelation is prophetic. And secondly, we understand that it's Christ-centered. But thir thirdly, we understand that the book of Revelation is symbolic. And uh, look at verse 1. It says that he sent and signified it. It suggests that the book uses from time to time, signs and symbols to convey a message. They say one picture is worth a thousand words. Well, some of the book of Revelation is symbolic. Like when they describe the Lord Jesus, they say that he has fire for eyes or that he has hair that is like wool or that his tongue is like a silver sword. Well, we know full well that Jesus doesn't have a sword hanging out of his mouth. We know full well that as a Jew, he did not have hair that was white like wool. We know that he does not have fire coming out of his eye sockets. We understand that, and we understand that to be symbolic, you see. And so we have to make the symbolism stay where symbolism is, and the things that are not symbolism, we'll learn to understand them as time goes on. I saw a chart one time of the book of Revelation, and it had a picture 
and a likeness of the Lord Jesus, not a picture, had a likeness of him with the wool hair and with fire in his eye sockets and a sword coming out of his mouth. And I thought to myself, how foolish. And I know what they were trying to convey, and I'm sure they were sincere in their conveying it. But they're talking about his eyes of judgment. They're talking about his, his purity. They're talking about the word of God, a two-edged sword that's in his mouth, because all Jesus ever spoke was the word of God. We must understand that. The spiritual symbolism would be clear to the Christian receiving the book, but it would make no sense to the Roman persecutors, those who persecuted Christians. They wouldn't understand all that, but to the Christians, they would. Number four, it's based on the Old Testament. It's based on the Old Testament. How do we know that? Because no book in the Bible contains, uh, excuse me, of the 404 verses in Revelation, 404 verses in Revelation, 278 of them are referring to Old Testament passages. That's an amazing fact, is it not? When you think about that. Now, what that means is 68.8% of the book of Revelation is taken from the Old Testament. And there are those today who say, and uh, I know this for a fact because it's been testified to me, that the New Testament is not made up of anything of the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is not for us today. Well, that's kind of silly, especially when the Apostle Paul said all the Old Testament stories and illustrations are given to us for our example. So we have to understand that means, that doesn't mean we're sacrificing lambs, but that means there are principles and understanding uh, th things that we need to understand concerning the Old Testament stories where we can learn, you see. And so the book of Revelation uses almost 70% of its writings to refer to the Old Testament. That's a lot. Number five, it's numerical. It's numerical. By way of a quick review, I said, first of all, it is prophetic. Secondly, it's Christ-centered. Thirdly, it is symbolic. Fourthly, it is based on the Old Testament. Number five, it is numerical. What do I mean by that? No book in the Bible contains so many symbolic numbers. That's it. They're all there. And there are many three and, uh, and a halves and sevens and twelves, not to mention 144,000 and all the rest of it. You go back to the book of Job and we find out that he had uh, five children and uh, the number of God's grace. We find out that he had one wife, God's uh, number for unity. We find out that he had so many animals and they're all in fives and sevens and tens and all the rest of that. And when Job got all of his children back, he ended up with 10. I'm not getting his children back, but when he ended up with more children, he ended up with 10 children. All these numbers are symbolic, but yet the book of Revelation has more. And the numbers are there to represent particular things. We'll see that as our study goes on. Number six, it is universal. What do I mean by that? John sees the nations from all over the world. Not just Israel, not just America, not just uh, uh, Africa, but all the nations of all the world, everywhere. And so the book covers that, and so it is universal in its application. Number seven, it is majestic. The book has been called the book of the throne because from chapter four to the end of the book, we read about the king of kings and his throne over and over and over again. And remember, the book of Revelation is about Jesus. And so we have to keep that in mind. Number eight, number eight. The book of Revelation is also sympathetic. What do I mean by that? Throughout the entire book, we see the sufferings of God's chosen people and his deliverance of them. Throughout the entire book. Yes, God's chosen people, the Jews. Oh, not, not the chosen people that are told today by, by Calvinism, not that kind of stuff. God's chosen people throughout the entire Bible are the Jews, not anyone else. The only person that's called a chosen servant after that, other than that, is Jesus Christ himself. Christians are never called God's chosen people unless they are Jews who ended up getting saved as God's chosen people. And so the entire book talks about how his people suffer and then how God delivers them totally in the end. And so we must understand that. Uh, number nine, it is climactic. It is climactic. Revelation is the climax of the Bible and shows the fulfillment of God's plan and God's purpose for his creation 
especially the Jewish people. And so we understand it goes to the end. You know, they say, well, I read the end of the book and I know what happens. Well, that, there's a lot to that. You read the book of Revelation, you find out how it's all going to end up. We find out that the devil, who is the god of this world, we find out how he is eventually cast into the eternal lake of fire. And he's there, and he will be there. I've heard preachers say, tell the devil to go on back to hell where he belongs. Well, he's not been there yet, but one day he will be. And one day he will be chained there, and he'll not be able to get out. We understand who wins in the end. And today we may have battles that we lose, but we do not lose the war in the end, that's for sure. The nasty God of this world, oh, smutty face, uh, the devil himself, the, uh, the, the father of all lies is going to end up losing in the end. And he knows that. But the book of Revelation is a, it's a book of a climatic end to all these things that happen. So Revelation outlines God's program for human history and shows the fulfillment of God's plan. What began ages ago in the first creation will ultimately complete it, be completed in the new creation. We come to the end of Revelation, what does he say? He sees a new heaven and he sees a new earth. And that's a marvelous truth when you think about it. The Bible says no more sea, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death. All those things are there. So we see that. And we find here that that new creation is going to be the end of the book. And the outline of the book, of the entire book, is found in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. And I want you to see that right now. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19 has got the outline that we're going to follow in this study. It says, Write the things which thou hast seen, number one, and the things which are, number two, and the things which shall be hereafter, number three. That's the outline we're going to look at. Now, It'll be more detailed than that, but that's what the book is all about. We're going to look at the things which thou hast seen. We're going to look at the things which are, and then we're going to see the things which shall be hereafter. What the Lord gave John that day can easily be divided into three parts. Chapter one is he saw Jesus. He saw Jesus. I'm looking forward to the day when I get to gaze upon my Savior. When I think about Fanny Crosby, I think about blind all of her life. Do you realize the first face that she saw when she passed away was the face of Jesus? She said, I'll see my Savior first of all, of one of the songs that she wrote. And many of her songs, if you've ever gone through the songbook and looked at the different ones that are written by Fanny Crosby, they have to do with seeing, which is something she could not do, but she would see. And uh, there's light for a look at the Savior, you see. All these different things that she wrote about, and the first one that she saw when she died was the Lord Jesus. That's incredible. That's chapter 1. The things which are, chapters 2 and 3, that's seven churches. And so we're going to be looking at the seven churches and find out what they were rebuked for or what they were blessed for. We will see that. And I will say more about this later on, but there's many today who teach that the seven uh, churches represent seven ages of uh, the, the Christian church. I do not follow that, I do not teach it, and number three, I do not believe it. I believe that the book of Revelation was given to the people then, and it addressed difficulties then, and that's what we're going to look at. We're not going to be looking at the Laodicean age or the Smyrna age or any of those things. We're going to be looking at seven churches, which were literal churches that formed almost a, a circle, but kind of more or less a sea, uh, there by the ocean. And we're, and we're going to understand what these churches, what God talked to them about, the things which are, seven letters to seven churches. And number three, the things which shall be, that's chapters 4 through 22. And that's the rapture and everything that follows it. In other words, we're gone. I was talking to a fellow here the other day that called me up, and he doesn't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. We do. And the Bible teaches that very, very clearly. And uh, one of his questions was, was, he says, well, what are you going to do with Revelation chapter 17 and 18? And I said, nothing. I'm not going to be here. <laughs> I said, I'm gone. I'm history. I'm out of this place. I'm, I'm going to be in heaven. You know, he didn't say another thing to me after that concerning that. Because he believes that Christians are going to go through the tribulation period. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches exactly the opposite that we are. It doesn't say that we're going to be delivered from, tri from tribulation. 
Goodness, tell that to the Christians that got fed to the lions and were uh, put in the arena and they were put to death. Tell that to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were put into the furnace and there they were supposed to be killed. Tell that to the Christians of the past. Tell that to the ones over in other countries who right now are suffering for their faith. God doesn't say we're going to be delivered from tribulations, but not a one of us are going to have to go through the seven-year tribulation period. Not the first half of it, certainly not the second half of it, and I say not any of it. The Bible says that the Antichrist is not even going to be revealed until after we're gone. And I say, well, who's the Antichrist? Don't know, don't care. Don't want to know who it is. Does he know who he is? I don't know because I don't know anything about him, but I believe he's alive today because Jesus could come back before the night is over with. And the Bible says when we are gone, the man of sin is going to be revealed. So I don't care who he is. I don't want to know who he is. I've, I've joked and said it might be one of your grandkids. It might be one of your children. I don't know. But the truth of the matter is I don't want to know who it is because he will not be revealed until after we're gone. See, does that mean that we won't know? That means we won't know. Does that mean that he won't know? He might not have it revealed to himself until we're gone. I don't know. But I also don't care. I'm not one who projects on that. And so, in the coming studies of this wonderful book, we're going to learn much about God's plan. And more than that, we're going to learn about Jesus. And I'm looking forward to that. But there are many Christians today who will say, well, I just don't understand the book of Revelation. They also say that about a lot of the Bible, too. And so they go to different versions of the Bible that are translated in different ways and all that because they say they can't understand the Bible. I double dog dare anybody to take their Bible and open it up anywhere. Take their finger and close their eyes and put their finger on any verse and find any verse that contains words that have more than two syllables. Other than names of cities and names of individuals, most of the words are single and double syllables and that's it. So why can't they understand it? The Bible teaches us that the book of Revelation is a book to be understood. Look again at Revelation 1.3. It says, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. He says, you're blessed. This is the only book that gives that promise. The only one. Now, you're blessed if you read the Bible, but this is the only one that's a promise that's given about a book. That must mean that it needs to be understood. And if you want a sweet blessing in your life, you need to read and heed the book of Revelation. But, it is a book to be understood. So why can't even God's people understand the book of Revelation? I'm going to give you two reasons why. I'm going to give you two reasons why people don't understand the book or they don't understand the Bible. Number one, it's because they're lazy. And yes, that's a rebuke. Even to my church family, because sometimes we get lazy, don't we? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 2, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as, as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. He says you're either too young or too lazy to understand the Bible. You know, people don't study the Bible today, do they? Now, I don't mean they got to go down to the Christian bookstore and buy a, a Wilson's Old Testament word studies, which I recommend. I don't believe they ought to, doesn't mean they got to go down to the Christian bookstore and get a Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament words, which I own, and I recommend it much, most of the time. That doesn't mean you have to go down and buy you a Greek lexicon so that you can understand the Greek language of the Bible. Most folks don't know any Greek anyhow. And that doesn't mean you got to get another book that I was given a number of years ago that's about that thick. It's one you buy by the pound, and it has every Old Testament word in it with its meaning and history. That doesn't mean you got to go down and do that. That doesn't even mean you got to go down and buy you a Strong's Concordance or a Cruden's Concordance or a, uh, or, any, or a Young's Concordance. What I learned in Bible college was you get a Strong's Concordance for the strong, and you get a Young's Concordance for the young, and you get a Cruden's concordance for the crude. That's how I learned it. But you know, that doesn't mean you got to go buy all those things because most folks are not going to be able to go buy them. Then they have to learn how to use them. 
That doesn't mean you have to have a, a Bible dictionary like I have in my office right now, a Davis Bible dictionary, which has a lot of good things in it. That doesn't mean any of those things. These people back then had none of those things. Mr. Wilson had not been born yet. Neither had Mr. Strong or Mr. Young or Mr. Crude. None of them had been born yet. Those are great tools to have, but these dear people in Bible times didn't have anything like that. And today, God's people won't even open up this book unless they have a dozen books laying around them so that they can understand what it says, you'll see. Say, are you rebuking us for not having, uh, uh, for, for having too many study tools? No, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying they didn't have those things. And maybe what we need to do is get back in and just study what the Word of God says, you see. Just read it and understand it. You might be surprised how often when you're reading the Bible, God will cross-reference it in your mind. I had a goal years ago, still do. It's still a goal in my life. And the goal in my life is, is that when I, I started memorizing Scripture a number of years ago, and I started memorizing Scripture topically, I didn't memorize a book, and I'm all for that. And I didn't memorize uh, uh, random things. I started memorizing the Bible in topics. Salvation by grace, baptism, the local church, uh, grace, all these different things I would have, I would be memorizing by topics. And my goal was then, and my goal is now. And by the way, that's, that goal started in 1974 when I bought my very first topical memory system from the Navigators, I got it in our Christian bookstore in Minnesota, and they had, and I thought it was $9.99 in the Christian bookstore. And I thought, I can afford 10 bucks to help me memorize, because I'm, I'm not a good re memorizer. And I bought that, I still got the original box and the original set of cards that I used to memorize, and they're just one topic after another. And I started memorizing topically. And that's why when I preach, there are perhaps dozens of other passages that come to mind while I'm preaching that are not even written in my outline. Why? Because it's like Prego spaghetti sauce. It's in there. Topically, of all things. And I suggest that people memorize the Bible no matter how they do it, but at least start memorizing and memorizing topically keeps all those things together. For example, how many verses can you quote on assurance of salvation? Just on knowing for sure you're saved. Can you memorize or have you, can you quote the plan of salvation? My first semester in Bible college in Minnesota, at Pillsbury Baptist Bible College, while I was there, our personal evangelism class, we had to memorize 128 verses in one semester. Word and punctuation, perfect. Week one, seven verses. Week two, seven more plus the first seven. Week three, seven more plus the first 14. That was what we had to do. Genesis 6, 5, Ecclesiastes 7, 20, Romans 6, 23, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter three. All these different ones that have to do with man being sinners of all things. All that came from memorizing topically, you see. And it comes in handy. It comes in real handy. So I say the number one reason that Christians don't understand the Bible is because they're lazy. They're not willing to study it. They're not willing just to read it for what it says. So I say to Christians, quit being lazy about it. Get in the book and start studying the book. You might be surprised what you'll find. But there is a second reason that people don't understand the Bible. Number one, they're lazy. But number two, they're lost. How do I know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, where the Bible says very, very plainly, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They don't understand the Bible because the Bible is what discerns them. Very interesting, the Bible says that an unsaved mind cannot comprehend nor understand the things of the Bible. Now, that doesn't mean they don't know the story of David and Goliath. That doesn't mean they can't understand the story of David and Bathsheba. That doesn't mean they can't understand something about King Solomon. That doesn't mean they can't understand the simple facts, but they have no spiritual understanding. And therefore, they have no way to spiritually discern the word of God. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. But if 
our gospel be hid. It is hid to them that are lost. That's a strong statement. It says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If the gospel's hid, it's hid to the lost. They can't understand it, you see. And that's why the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to share the word of God with the unsaved so they can understand and know what it means to be saved, you see. And how important that is for all of us to understand. I decided years ago, and I've had my lazy days, but I've decided I don't want to be a lazy Christian when it comes to learning the Word of God. I've decided that I'm going to be diligent to add to my faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and all these other things. I'm going to be diligent about that in my own personal life. Now, I can't make anybody else be diligent, but I can challenge you to be diligent. Say, how much do we have to study a day? I want just study something. Study something. As Dr. Tom Malone was asked one time by a preacher boy, how much Bible do you read a day? And he said, I read till my heart burns. That taught me a tremendous lesson. In other words, he got more out of reading until his heart burned instead of going through a Bible reading schedule, which is not a wrong thing to do. One of my professors in college put together a chronological Bible. One of the interesting things, one of the interesting things to read through because it chronologically, it starts with John chapter one and verse one. In the beginning, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then it goes into the book of Genesis and then it goes back and forth chronologically of what happens throughout the word of God. It's great reading, but you don't have to have one of those to understand the Bible, you see. And so what I am saying is, is if you're lazy, start studying. If you're lost, get saved. Because when you study the book of Revelation, whether historically or prophetically, all of your studies should be a, a practical application. And so I made a determination 15 years ago when we first started teaching Revelation. Prophecy that is taught that only fills your head is useless. It needs to motivate you to do something for God. It needs to motivate you to be a better witness. It needs to motivate you to understand the book. It needs to motivate you to do something besides sit down and do nothing in your life. Oh, we had a great prophetic conference and I learned so much. Okay, how's it going to change your life? How's it going to make you a better, more vibrant Christian? How's it going to change your Christianity? And so my goal throughout this entire Bible study, all these sermons I'm going to preach on Sunday night, and I told you I might end up not just studying it with you, I might end up preaching a little bit like I've done tonight. But how's it going to change your life? Are you going to let it change your life? Shall we stand?